and uh, I have been trying to do a little bit of drag work, uh, but I haven't done very much of it at all. And so um, I got involved with this um, satellite mission called Cygnus, um, which is very interesting. And so I'm going to go through Cygnus a little bit and tell you why it's sort of relevant to um, the drag problem and debris and stuff like that. This moves forward. Oh, maybe I have to stop. Maybe. Okay, um, so the Cygnus satellites uh, are, the Cyg Cygnus is a constellation mission with eight satellites. Um, what we really would like to do is have the satellites equally spaced around an orbit plane. Uh, but really, once we deploy them, they're not going to want to be equally spaced at all. They're going to start spreading out, and they'll actually cluster, and then they'll spread apart again, and then they'll cluster again. And we don't really want that to happen. Uh, so what we're going to do is try to use uh, differential drag to keep them equally spaced. So really quickly, what Cygnus does is it, it measures the, uh, the wind speed over the ocean um, by measuring GPS signals. So this is a sat Cygnus satellite here, and there are antennas here and here on it, and it measures the GPS signal reflected off of the ocean, and the reflected power from the reflected signal tells you basically how turbulent the uh, ocean surface is. Is it possible to mute this? Because I can hear myself and it is really funky. <laughs> or maybe just the volume down. Oh, that's fantastic. Much better. OK. Um, so if the ocean is perfectly calm, uh, then the reflected GPS signal is very, very strong. But if the ocean is very, very turbulent, then the reflected signal is very weak. And so by measuring the reflected power, you actually get a, a, a measurement of how turbulent the ocean is. And the turbulence on the ocean is directly dependent on the wind speed. And so you basically can get um, wind speed from the reflected power of the GPS signal. So what we're really interested in is measuring uh, hurricanes or tropical cyclones and trying to figure out how um, tropical cyclones evolve. And that's the main science of Cygnus. And we have eight satellites that will do this. So this is the concept of Cygnus. So you can see the Cygnus satellites down here. And the GPS satellites are blue. They're way out. And they're sending down signals. And the Cygnus satellites are measuring those reflected signals across the globe. And it makes swaths across the globe. Uh, and so each of these points down here on the, on the surface of the Earth are measurement points. So that's basically how this the constellation works. So in one orbit, you get some swath that looks like this. In two orbits, 15 orbits, you basically have complete coverage over the whole globe. Um, now what happens is that the way that we're going to deploy these satellites are on one single launch vehicle. So you have this upper stage here, which um, kicks off each of the satellites. Now the satellites go off at some velocity, which means that the satellite that is moving like in this direction goes into a slightly higher orbit. The satellite that goes in this direction is going to a slightly lower orbit. And so their periods are different. 
and that means that they'll one will um, lap the other one eventually. Okay, and all eight of those satellites have slightly different periods, and they'll try to lap each other. And we don't really want that to happen. So what we really want to happen is, as these things spread out across the globe, we want them to sort of slow down here and then become equally spaced. And so what we're doing to do to make that happen is we're going to use differential drag. So the Cygnus satellites, as you saw in that uh, deployment video, the Cygnus satellites are shaped sort of like birds. So when the satellite is flying in this orientation, like that, it's in a very, very low drag profile. All right? But if we tilt it up like this, then it has a huge area to mass ratio, and then it, it sort of falls like a rock. All right? uh, and then the, so the area to the, from the top to, the, the, uh, to this side is a ratio of about 7 to 1. So you get about seven times more drag in this profile than in that profile. All right, and we're going to try to use that um, to basically put all the satellites at the same altitude. There's also uh, the fact that we're going to have eight satellites in a roughly 500 kilometer orbit, which is fantastic for collisions. Uh, there's a lot of debris, as you guys all know, at around 500 kilometers. Uh, and we have eight satellites that we want to avoid collisions with all this other stuff. And so what we've done is done some initial risk estimates of how often we're going to actually have probabilities of um, collisions. And so um, uh, we've worked with NASA's Conjunction Assessment Risk Analysis Team and basically done some statistics on how often we're going to have uh, probabilities of coll collisions. And this uh, plot here shows roughly um, uh, how many collisions or how many days there will be between uh, possible collision events. And so this is the closest approach. So how basically sensitive we are to um, risk. You know, if, if it comes within 500 meters of you, do you take action, or do you wait until it comes within 200 meters of you? Um, if you say 500 meter, meters is the threshold for when we should actually start thinking about this, then we're going to have um, every 40 days for each of the satellite, or for basically um, uh, for the mission, Every 40 days, one of our satellites will have a possible encounter uh, within 500 kilometers or 500 meters. All right. So every 40 days, we're going to have to think about collisions. Now, what we've thought about doing for these uh, collision avoidance maneuvers is exactly the same thing that we're thinking about for. Um, doing the satellite constellation spacing, which is um, change the or, or the or the drag characteristics of the satellite and drop the satellite down by a little bit. And then we would hopefully miss the object. Um, and so you have to, it's basically just like um, uh, trying to avoid or trying to have a, an asteroid avoid the Earth. The longer you have, um, the longer lead time you have, the more effective your mitigation strategy is. And so this axis tells you how much time there is uh, before the probability of collision or before the collision event. This one tells you the in-track uh, distance that you would have if you do it, did a maneuver. And this one says, uh, this line says, if we have five hours in our high drag um, position or orientation, how much distance would we, um, would we add to our, um, our miss? All right. So this basically says that if we, ha if we only have like half a day and we put it into five hours, uh, five hours of high drag orientation, 
then we would miss by roughly uh, one kilometer. All right. And so um, these curves basically tell us uh, how much time we have um, to do our mitigation. So in order to actually do this type of stuff, one of the key things here is F10.7. That's basically how bright the sun is uh, in extreme ultraviolet. So the sun um, heats up our thermosphere and it causes the densities to uh, become larger or smaller depending on whether the sun is more active or less active. And we use this model called the Global Ionosphere Thermosphere Model, uh, which I developed at University of Michigan to do these types of uh, propagation. So GITM is a pretty large code. Um, it solves self-consistently for the ionosphere thermosphere over the whole globe. It solves nine neutral species, seven or five ion species, solves for the neutral winds, the ion electron velocities, and the ion uh, neutral and electron temperatures. And it solves um, in altitude coordinates. Most models like this are, are what are called hydrostatic, uh, which means they basically assume gravity and um, gradient and pressure balance each other. And so there can't be very strong vertical winds, but GITM allows that. And that matters because um, the aurora uh, actually heats up the thermosphere pretty dramatically. And it heats it up very rapidly, so you get very large uh, vertical velocities uh, in the auroral regions. And the aurora is one of the main heat sources uh, for the thermosphere in times where there's geomagnetic activity. And that's what we really care about. Um, and so you can actually have what are called non-hydrostatic solutions. All right, so basically you can get large winds due to all of these forces. Uh, you can do runs in 1D and 3D, which is very good for um, debugging. I do all of my coding on my laptop, actually. And then when I want to um, run a real simulation, I put it onto a NASA machine and I run it on 300 processors. Um, um, you have really good chemistry in there. And we have a very uh, interesting grid. Um, you basically have blocks that you decide on, and then you can run with as many blocks as you want in latitude and longitude. So you can run with whatever resolution you want. We've run as low resolution as like 10 degrees by 20 degrees, which is absolutely horrible resolution, but you can run it on your laptop, to uh, 0.35 degree resolution, which is about 35, 40 kilometers in um, uh, in lo latitude resolution, which is extremely high resolution. Um, and we've run it on up to 320 processors on the NASA supercomputers. Um, we have lots of high latitude inputs, so you can specify what type of auroral model you want. Um, you can run it coupled to other models, like a global magnetosphere model to input aurora and everything uh, in there to um, try to predict um, what's going to happen. And then you can fly satellites dynamically through the code. So the code will track satellites and it will output values at the satellite locations. So you can get, instead of having to output gigantic 3D files, you can output um, very high time resolution values at specific satellites. So um, the the space environment, the environment where satellites propagate through, uh, is, is very strongly controlled um, uh, by the sun. So the sun um, has extreme ultraviolet light, which is absorbed in the thermosphere. And that can change the density on the day side by about a factor of two or three uh, from solar minimum to solar maximum. And you also have the aurora, which can really quickly heat up the atmosphere. And it can change um, the global scale uh, temperature structure and density structure within a matter of hours. And I'll show an example of that. It's really difficult to actually predict the mass density in the winds uh, for more than just a few hours ahead of time. 
because we don't actually know what the sun is doing ahead of time. Uh, so it's, it's quite difficult. Uh, so I'm going to go through a little bit of um, derivation for why winds are important um, in the thermosphere. Um, so you guys all know this as a drag equation here. And this is the equation which um, uh, you obviously use to propagate satellites, but it's also an equation, yeah, it's a, also an equation which allows you, if you reverse the equation here, um, you can measure the thermospheric mass density here by uh, measuring the uh, acceleration that a satellite feels, right? So satellites such as uh, CHAMP, Ray, Swarm, and Gochi um, all measure their acceleration, uh, or deceleration as it is. Uh, and from that acceleration, you measure the mass density, all right? And then we, as thermospheric modelers, use this mass density to um, validate our codes. And we tune our codes to match what the satellites show us. The, now, the satellites don't measure the winds here. All right? And so this is an error term. Um, and no one really ever accounts for that error. So I wanted to look and see what type of error that actually puts in. So the error, uh, if you have a density and you have an assumed density, is, is like this. You put in the formula here, and you come up with a value that looks like this. So the error is equal to the velocity uh, of the in-track satellite divided by the velocity minus the velocity of the in-track uh, uh, wind squared. All right, so as VW VW is usually somewhere on the order of like 400 meters per second, while V is on the order of 7,600 meters per second. So usually it's really, really, really small, and the error is almost negligible. Also, if you're doing an orbit average, it's, it's even more negligible. So here's uh, an example. This shows an example of the wind structure um, over an orbit. Um, so the wind is, say, coming towards you, and then it's going away from you there. So during nominal conditions, it's like that. The orbit average wind velocity is zero uh, because winds, um, if you didn't have an orbit average equal to zero, then there would be upwelling somewhere on the Earth or downwelling. And there's usually not gigantic upwells and downwells except in like hurricanes and tornadoes and stuff. Those are very localized features. But during a storm, you can get these gigantic winds here. And so if you put that in and you look at the errors, then you can get, actually during a storm, you can have errors, localized errors that are up to 50%. Uh, and then down on the other side, minus 30%. Okay, so it's asymmetric, first of all. And that asymmetry actually causes an orbit average error of about 6%. So you can have an orbit average error in your density of about 6% during storms due to this. And the Air Force would like us to be able to predict satellite locations or satellite densities uh, that are caused by drag up to 5% error, or at most 5% error. And so this error it is worse than that. Uh, so this is an example of a storm here. Um, this shows mass density as a function of time. And you can see the mass density actually increases by a factor of three here and by a factor of about five there. All right. So the mass density increases very, very rapidly, and then it descends gradually over time. So you have to take this into account when you're doing propagation. All right, so there's the summary. It basically just says that we're working on modeling the thermosphere, and we're trying to do that to help um, our mission, our Cygnus mission, to um, not have collisions and to put them into the right um, locations in the constellation. Thanks.